Um, I'm broadcasting you to, to you from London, Ontario, Canada. And I especially want to welcome um, cancer survivors or uh, cancer patients who are pondering uh, a treatment for the prostate disease and those who just happen to be in the right age group uh, where this disease is prevalent. I also welcome your families and your friends who are listening in. Um, I will uh, share my screen now and pop up some slides that I will discuss with you. Uh, so um, I want to describe basically my cancer journey and have a bit of a focus on why medical imaging is so important. So a little bit about me. I was born in Montreal. I am bilingual in case there are any questions in French that pop up. Um, and I uh, am a retired medical physicist with about 40 years of experience, some of that experience uh, in training at Princess Margaret Hospital and the University of Toronto, and subsequently for about 10 years at the Cross Cancer Institute, and more recently at the London Regional Cancer Program. Uh, I'm a retired professor at Western. I have some commercial disclosures with a small company in London, Modus Medical Devices, uh, and also with previous uh, research grants sponsored by the Ontario government in concert with the following companies. What's the purpose of medical imaging? Well, especially with radiation therapy, we are aiming invisible rays at an invisible target. If you can't see it, you can't hit it. If you can't hit it, you can't cure it. These words were spoken by uh, Professor Harold Johns and possibly Dr. Uh, Bill Powers, um, and, and both are pioneers in the field of radiation oncology. Now, when it comes to an image, here's a prostate image, magnetic resonance image, and Dr. Masum Hader will be describing this in much more detail. Also, Dr. Bauman, a radiation oncologist, will be describing how we can zap these tumor cells uh, using high energy x-rays. So a little bit about imaging. Um, to image, we have to shine some kind of energy onto the patient. And uh, if we measure the transmitted rays, for example, transmitted x-rays, we can form a radiograph that I'm sure many of you have seen before. It's a two-dimensional image. And a lot of the structures are superimposed on each other. So the next method that is three-dimensional is computed tomography or CT scanning or CAT scanning. And it also reveals uh, more details because a single thin slice through the body is imaged. This one is a, a slice from a foot point of view, uh, you know, as if you were imaging just one little thin slice here. Um, and uh, the prostate does come popping out as well as all the bony structures and so on and the, and the rectum. And also not seen here is the bladder. Uh, but uh, the point is that this is a, a three-dimensional technique. Now, if we look instead at the reflected rays, for example, ultrasound waves, we can form an ultrasound image like this. And there, here there's an abnormality showing. We can also uh, shine radio waves onto the body and uh, detect some echoed waves. And these form magnetic resonance imaging uh, as, as the patient is placed in a big magnetic field. We can also inject radioactivity. And uh, if we do that, I'm just going to move my picture over. If we do that, um, the radioactivity will preferentially lodge onto tumor cells. Once there, the radioactivity decays and shoots out other rays, gamma rays, for example, and they could be imaged with a gamma camera in a nuclear medicine department. And this forms a positron emission tomography image, for example. And I'll show you that. That's what that looks like. It's highly colorful, and it shows the intense regions of, of cancer and less intense re regions. And this image has actually been superimposed and mixed with the black and white background image of MRI. So this is state-of-the-art imaging right now in prostate uh, cancer. I will stop talking as a physicist and switch and become a patient, take off my physics hat. And if you have not seen this Three Stooges uh, skit, I encourage you to uh, look it up on YouTube. It's quite hilarious. Okay, let's look at uh, my cancer diagnosis. In 2018, my PSA went to 6.2 nanograms per milliliter, sometimes shown as micrograms per liter, but it's the same numerical value. 
uh, and it was above the threshold 4.5 uh, for normality. At the time, I was age 68. I went into uh, for a ultrasound guided biopsy, and uh, this is how that works. Uh, an ultrasound probe is inserted in the rectum, and then uh, this device inserts a needle into the prostate that can be seen with the ultrasound, and it pulls out little samples, little cores uh, of the tissue to be examined by a pathologist. In my case, uh, my prostate volume was small. 12 cores were removed and four were cancer positive. A Gleason score is a pathological score. It shows kind of the severity of, of, the, of the tumor cells. And uh, in my case, I had a Gleason score of seven of 10. This was staged as a grade two group or a stage T1C. So still fairly early in terms of, um, of the disease. So I stayed on watchful waiting or what's called active surveillance. And I enjoyed uh, many years, three years without any side effects because I was not treated. But soon my PSA began to accelerate and rise, 9.52. And in January of this year, 2022, it rose to 10. And I became alarmed and thought that uh, I'd rather have treatment now rather than a ticking bomb uh, inside my pelvis. So this went through a number of uh, decisions. I will start here. Uh, I was considered a low risk patient. I was um, certainly um, a candidate for curative treatment. And, I, and then I decided I might go for curative treatment at some point. I had a lot of consultations with a urologist and radiation oncologist. And in the end, uh, I decided to do nothing, um, just active surveillance for a while. Uh, just regular PSA tests. Uh, I did not have secondary biopsies. And then at some point, um, I saw the rise in PSA and decided to proceed to an active form of treatment. So let's look at the, what happens here. It basically becomes a risk versus benefit trade-off. Um, we all want a, a durable maximum tumor control, but at the same time, we want to minimize side effects that are psychological urinary or uh, in the bowel, and, and uh, prevent sexual dysfunction. So I consulted with a lot of experts. You see them here. And uh, if you're a candidate, then the surgery can be performed. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively minor surgery uh, with manual techniques or even robotic techniques. Alternatively, there's brachytherapy, the implantation of radioactive seeds right into the tumor bed. This can be done at low dose rate or high dose rate. Low dose rate, these seeds stay in the body forever uh, and they just naturally uh, decay. The radioactivity just decays away in months to a year. External beam radiotherapy is like a Star Wars technique uh, and the beams are shot from outside the body. They are intensity modulated, IMRT. And sometimes they, they the beams are moved and rotate right around the patient and that's called VMAT. Other uh, modalities include high intensity focused ultrasound called HIFU. Uh, lasers have been used in the past, cryotherapy, freezing the prostate or heating it with ultrasound. So the prostate's been insulted by a variety of agents. In uh, some cases, add-ons uh, of hormone uh, therapy and immunotherapy are, uh, are administered. In the hormone case, uh, this is to, to prevent the, the, the tumor from replicating itself. So uh, these are the choices, but I want to flag something here that if, if one elects to go directly to radiation or these other forms, uh, it sometimes trumps the ability to go back later if things don't work out and have surgery. So that's an important uh, message. And it is one of the reasons why a lot of patients opt for surgery first, uh, because it doesn't negate these afterwards, but the reciprocal is not true. So we now face the paralysis of choice. Uh, this is a plot of uh, basically treatment success, the higher, the better, uh, against the years of cancer after cancer treatment. And you can see that surgery is certainly uh, appealing uh, with success rates of 80 to 95% and a durable um, uh, removal of, of the cancer. Uh, you know, this is like 13 years out from the, from the surgery. 
Uh, brachytherapy is the blue one. Um, very nice outcomes, very high outcomes, maybe a little less duration, 12 years. And external beams, when this study was made, uh, also very high uh, early results. Uh, then it seems to sag a little bit, but I must say these these uh, data sets are a little bit old, and I suspect that now the green blob would overlap more with these previous two. So I opted for something called stereotactic or three-dimensional radiation uh, therapy. Um, there's the treatment planning involved. Um, the doses are all simulated and calculated uh, before treatment. Uh, and as far as the treatment alignment, uh, three small markers are placed into the prostate, for example, here. Uh, and it's similar to a brachytherapy procedure, but with uh, sort of cold uh, iodine seeds, little tiny cylinders the size of a grain of rice. And three of them are implanted <clears throat> for triangulation, basically, of how to fire the radiation beam so they all hit the target. During treatment, the rectum must be empty and the bladder must be full. Uh, and we use, uh, sorry, a linear accelerator, a LINAC is the buzzword, uh, with high energy x-rays, 10 million volt x-rays and a high dose rate. And there's also an onboard radiographic system and CT imaging system that uses lower energies and lower doses as well. The treatment course is highly convenient, five days spread out over one and a half weeks. And my treatment went uh, around Valentine's Day in 2022 at the London Cancer Center. So the 3D treatment plan looks like this. These are computed radiation dose distributions. You can see the ultra high dose in the red zone here, and you can see it quickly kind of fades away in the neighboring regions, which is what we want. We, we want to spare the rectum here and, and the bladder that's up here, although not very visible. This is a foot view slice, as I talked before, but you, it is three-dimensional imaging. And you can see that uh, a side view is possible. You can see the, the tailbone here, the coccyx, uh, pelvic bone at the front, and, th and there's the, the bladder uh, above this uh, target. And the same on a front view slice, more familiar to you, you can see the, the hip bones, and you can see, again, uh, sparing of the, uh, the bladder above and the rectum below. These are a hefty radiation doses. Um, it's eight uh, times 500 centigrade, uh, and that's 4,000 centigrade of radiation. And uh, it's with 10 megavolt x-rays. And uh, just to put this in context, background radiation from cosmic radiation or radiation from the soil in the earth um, amounts to about 0.2 centigrade per year. We're all subjected to that for our lifetime. So uh, this is significantly more. And uh, here's another example that 400 centigrade given to the whole body from head to toe would be pretty well fatal. Uh, and you can see that it's, this is in the fatal range, but it is highly confined to a very small volume in the body. Uh, remember it was about, for me, 20 centimeters cubed. And so you survived that quite nicely. So let's talk about the treatment at the cancer center. Uh, this is the entrance room to the radiation bunker. Um, there are lights that flash on when, when the radiation's on and warning lights of radiation, but it is a very unique design. It's an open door bunker design, so you can uh, have uh, the radiotherapists uh, come into the room uh, if, if you're feeling any discomfort and give you some immediate help instead of waiting for a large uh, lead door to pop open. So this is quite innovative, and the design was developed at the London Regional Cancer Program, and it's used throughout Ontario, many places in Canada, and some international locations uh, with a very clever interlock design that as soon as somebody walks in, the beam turns off. So here's uh, talking about the beam is the LINAC, and I'll now talk about some of the components of this LINAC. This one was a true beam system uh, manufactured by Varian. So... Here's the head of the machine. It produces the high energy x-rays that come flying out here through this uh, beam shaper called a multi-leaf collimator that reshapes the beam on the fly. At this end, we have the x-ray tube and it shoots through the patient and you can see a detector at the far end that picks up the transmitted radiation 
to form a radiograph or a CT image if we rotate and get a lot of views around the patient. So filling the bladder uh, before treatment is relatively easy. You drink a large water bottle. Uh, emptying the rectum is uh, not, not so nice. Uh, so these are enemas. Uh, there are four shown here because I had already used one after the first treatment. So I use this as a counter of the number of treatments I was getting. And so there were four left in my schedule. And also, interestingly, uh, during uh, my time um, on, the, on the treatment machine, the uh, radiotherapist offered me to listen to some music. And I thought, that's great. I am a musician. So I listened to James Taylor. It was very soothing as the machine went through all its uh, motions and acrobatics uh, to be listening to James Taylor. Here's an example of the radiograph with the inserted BBs that I mentioned, the, uh, these little seeds here. And you can see them. The third one is a little harder to find, but uh, the therapists are trained to look at these and make sure everything lines up before firing the beams. So did the radiation hit the right place? Did it really work? And the answer is yes, yeah, so far, so good. So here's my start uh, in 2018. Here we are in 2022 with the last... Uh, treatment. There's my counter. And soon after, within a month, the PSA took a nosedive to below one and stayed there. And then it bounced up a bit, went up to two. And now hopefully it, uh, is on the downside again and will remain uh, below uh, one and hopefully reach even a zero. Uh, when you finish treatment at our cancer center, the London Cancer Center, you're permitted to, uh, to, to bong a gong <laughs> And uh, I can tell you, this was a really great feeling. Uh, this is in the waiting room, radiotherapy waiting room. And as you gong it, uh, the other patients uh, cheer you on as you have completed your full course of treatment. So going back to the risk benefit trade-offs, uh, I have achieved tumor control. I don't know if it's durable yet, it's early. Um, and I also have experienced, I would say minor side effects. Psychological ones, well, you know you are a cancer patient and uh, it affects you and your family. Uh, I've had minor urinary changes or bowel changes and basically no, no major uh, change in sexual uh, dysfunction, bearing in mind that I am uh, a senior citizen and, uh, and, and my starting uh, function was not uh, at 100%. The elephant in the room for, uh, for patients, uh, males, is, is clearly this last one here. And, uh, and Terry Peters, my colleague, will be describing a little bit more about the uh, elephant in the room, the sexual dysfunction, uh, when he uh, gives his discourse a little bit later in this presentation. So here are some individuals from the, from the London area and Western University. Uh, Jake Van Dyke, a medical physicist that I, it was my colleague, uh, for many, many years. And he produced this book, by the way. And if you're interested in medical physics, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. It's, it's intended for the lay public, describes uh, how many medical physicists went through their careers and some interesting uh, internal stories that they tell. Um, on this side, we see Dr. Aaron Fenster. He's not speaking today, but he is a world leader in the development of ultrasound techniques, especially for taking more precise biopsies. Here I am at a slightly younger age with the gold medal from the Organization of Medical Physics in Canada. And here is uh, my friend and colleague, Terry Peters, and he will be speaking later on in this session. So I uh, want to uh, thank you for uh, listening. And I will now stop sharing the screen and uh, return control to uh, Teresa. is uh, Dr. Masoom Hader, so I'm going to call oh, okay. Dr. Hader up. That's okay, don't worry. Um, so, Dr. Hader, if you can uh, get your... Perfect, and I'm going to introduce you. Great. Um, Dr. Hader is a, radiation, a radiologist and clinician scientist at Mount Sinai Hospital and Princess Margaret Hospital and a professor at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on validating imaging biomarkers using several technologies such as CT and multi 
parametric MRI, which is a special type of MRI scan that produces a more detailed picture. Dr. Hader will talk about prostate cancer screening, detection, diagnosis. He will include examples of MRI strategies that are now in use in the clinic, as well as other technologies that are being developed. Thank you, Masu. Thank you, uh, Teresa. It's a pleasure to uh, spend time with you this afternoon and to talk directly to some patients uh, about prostate MR and its role in diagnosis in prostate cancer. Uh, the journey on this from a research side started uh, almost 20 years ago, and uh, prostate cancer was one of the few cancers where there really wasn't a good diagnostic imaging test to tell where the cancer is uh, before surgery or uh, radiation treatment. Uh, and really, we wouldn't have got where we are today with a lot of support from taxpayers, the OICR, our own practice plan, and the University of Toronto. Uh, so I want to acknowledge all the uh, colleagues, collaborators, and uh, funding agencies uh, who were instrumental in, in these developments. So I'm going to go through um, a few patient scenarios and illustrate how imaging is used today uh, in the workup of prostate cancer. So this is really in making that initial diagnosis. And then spend a few minutes talking about some new image guided treatment uh, approaches. So the, the commonest scenario around the age of 50 is that you go to your family doctor and uh, 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 you get a PSA test done, uh, plus or minus a digital rectal exam. And that can be normal. Uh, if it's less than one, it's very good news. But it, uh, depending on your age, if it's higher than that, and particularly if it's getting over four or rising, um, it, it's worrisome. And the next step is usually a referral to a urologist uh, and consideration of, of biopsy. Um, and the, the approach in the past before we had advanced imaging like MR was to do what's called a systematic biopsy. Uh, and this is one of the few sites in the body where this approach is taken to diagnose cancer historically. And in this approach, what would happen is, is that we knew from uh, a surgical series where the prostate was taken out that about 70% of the cancers occurred at the back half of the prostate in something called the peripheral zone, which is an anatomic area of the prostate. And so, and about 30% occurred in uh, what let's call unusual locations. Um, and so the strategy for putting the needles in was to... Uh, um, as uh, Dr. Batista showed, to kind of uh, put that ultrasound probe in the rectum and then aim these needles systematically uh, into the, these areas where cancer commonly occurred. Um, but um, with this approach and all these needles, up to 12 needles, about 20 to 30 percent of cancers, depending on the technology used, the skill of the operator, how big your prostate is, all these things, uh, were missed, and this was a real problem. Uh, and in particular, in these zones, uh, there were issues. The second consequence of biopsying everyone with a high PSA was that we ended up detecting cancers that were not really clinically significant. And by that, I mean that in, the, in prostate cancer, and we're seeing this more and more in, in cancer, uh, uh, in other sites as well, that there's, there are cancers that are very indolent. And this is particularly true in prostate cancer. Just because uh, someone tells you that you have a prostate cancer does not mean that it is going to be a problem for you. Uh, um, it, it can be a very low-grade cancer. And in fact, um, there was a real issue with overtreatment uh, 10 years ago and more where active surveillance was real, not really available and many patients were overtreated. They ended up with uh, surgery or radiation and the side effects of that when it, perhaps it would have been better just to follow them uh, and uh, catch the cancer uh, when its characteristics change. So uh, the line here is most men will die with prostate cancer, but not from prostate cancer. And so this concept uh, with the big C letter for, for you as a patient is, is, uh, requires careful discussion and explanation. So how are we going to deal with this issue of overtreatment? Um, 
Well, certainly, you know, and I heard this is a quote from a urologist I heard, well, if the prostate was on the elbow, this wouldn't be an issue. We'd just take it out. Uh, but um, in fact, uh, prostate cancer is often a multifocal disease and whole gland treatment is, uh, is the most definitive treatment, but it, it leads to problems, sexual dysfunction, urinary continence issues, bowel continence issues. Um, and, and so we have to be a little bit cautious about jumping into whole gland treatment. And so uh, I'm going to share this scenario with you. This was uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, uh, and uh, this is a 68-year-old man who had a PSA, which uh, went from 2 to 2.5 to 3 and then to uh, 3.9 over a span of about two years. And um, we had a research study ongoing, and so we did an MR on him. And I will tell you that there is a prostate cancer right here. Uh, so right in this area here, really small, uh, but a definite cancer. Uh, and all the techniques to identify these were developed uh, with research uh, uh, trials and so on. And so this patient had a targeted biopsy only. Uh, three needles were selectively put in using technology actually developed uh, with Dr. Fenster and the group in London. Uh, so we did this biopsy at Sunnybrook and uh, uh, it was under a grant sponsored by the OICR. And those three biopsies all came back positive for Gleason 3 plus 4 cancer. Uh, the next thing that happened was, so I'll just show you that's where the cancer is. Um, it looks like a bit of a smudge on the scan. Uh, and, and we've developed these biopsy strategies now to do the targeted biopsies uh, in cancer and uh, gone from what I would say a scenario of uh, really kind of doing these systematically to really have having some aid in, in how we can, we can take the samples. And here's an example of some of that technology. Uh, in use, uh, these uh, ultrasound fusion-based technologies. Uh, this is Dr. Milo, one of my colleagues at Sunnybrook, uh, when I was practicing there, uh, doing one of these fusion biopsies. Uh, the community also developed a scoring scale. You should see on your MR reports a five-point scoring scale for your cancers. So there's standardizations for quality and reporting that have been developed. Uh, and there was a recent... Uh, uh, statement on this by the Canadian Association of Radiology. So you really need to, it's a sign that you had a good quality exam and a good quality report. If you see something called a PIRAD score on your report from the radiologist, and if you don't, you should maybe ask your urologist uh, about this. And uh, so good quality MR interpretation is extremely important to making the right decisions in your care and guidelines have been published on this in Ontario now, um, and uh, educational efforts are underway to make sure this gets to all patients in Ontario. There has been very good quality evidence about the role of MR in patients who've never had a biopsy before. And I won't go through this whole table, but just to show you that we don't, overall, we don't miss uh, uh, more cancers um, when we do MR, but what we do do is, is we avoid unnecessary biopsy and unnecessary detection of low-grade cancers. This is the biggest benefit. If you've never had a biopsy before and have an MR and the MR is negative, you can avoid having those 12 needles in the prostate, and uh, that requires some discussion with your physician. There have been two large prospective multicenter trials on this. So this is the highest level of evidence that we have for uh, you know, selecting a test uh, in this scenario. One was done in Europe and UK, and the other was done here in Canada with Vancouver, Montreal, London, and two centers, large centers in Toronto. And we confirmed that we can safely avoid biopsy in about a third of men. This trial was sponsored by Prostate Cancer Canada and the OICR. So uh, certainly philanthropy and patient donations played a significant role in helping this trial get done here in Canada. And the net result of this was very concrete. Uh, there were published a set of guidelines um, uh, very recently, uh, and this should, this should be reaching all, of, all the urologists in the province should be aware of this. Um, 
that multi-parametric MRI is now recommended prior to biopsy in patients who are candidates for curative management. Uh, in fact, the Ontario government today announced um, funding for additional MRs in the province and more MR hours. So we're hoping that our wait lists will come down uh, because we're going to need more MR access with these new guidelines. And the major effect of using MR is reducing the number of patients being biopsied, reducing the diagnosis of insignificant cancer, and reducing the total number of biopsies. But you have to remember that if we were to compare the results of taking your prostate out and having a pathologist look at your prostate with a microscope against MR, MR is not a perfect test. No imaging test is perfect. And small clinically significant cancers can be missed. And so it's very important that you have a discussion with your physician about the risks and benefits of avoiding a biopsy. So um, I can tell you that the patient I just showed you, the first patient, elected, even though they, they had a small three plus four cancer, they had a choice. They could go on active surveillance. Um, they could have uh, the prostate taken out with the side effects. They could have had radiation therapy. They elected to have the prostate taken out. Um, they do still have problems with continence, but it's manageable but they are cancer-free with a PSA of zero more than 10 years later. So that was a discussion. There were a lot of options, and that patient was very risk-averse, did not want to take a chance of, uh, of, of leaving that cancer in. It was 3 plus 4, so it's not a completely indolent cancer, uh, and there was risk associated with leaving it in, so elected to have it out, and they're doing fine. The surgeon did it with uh, robotically and it was a very easy surgery. Uh, I was told 20 minutes of very little blood loss. So, um, so that's an example of what happened to that patient. We're anticipating up to uh, 10,000 additional MRs per year in the province because of this. So those additional MRs are very important. Um, and um, uh, uh, I, I think this will have a real impact on the the healthcare for men uh, in Canada. All right, scenario two, my PSA is rising. I had a biopsy, but it showed no cancer. My PSA is still rising. What do I do? Um, these were where a lot of the earlier studies in MR showed a lot of benefit. And uh, in fact, in this scenario, we detect five to 10% more cancers than if you had another biopsy another systematic biopsy. So in this scenario in particular, remember I showed you those little blind areas, those red areas on the biopsy scheme. Uh, and in, in this scenario, MR can be really useful. So if you're in this scenario and you haven't had an MR before your next biopsy, you should have a discussion with your physician about having an MR uh, at a qualified center. So, um, so this is a good one for MR. Uh, and in fact, in that first patient I showed you, that cancer was in a location that would have been missed with a standard biopsy because it was so far in the front of the prostate. Uh, so this is a good one to have an MR done, uh, and this is also in the guidelines. Um, what about a third scenario? So this is one where you have a cancer, but it's a low-grade cancer, so you're on surveillance, um, uh, and so that's a very specific follow-up protocol at uh, done by your urologist or your radiation oncologist uh, in concert with your family physician, where you're being followed for uh, rising. Uh, you're being followed for your PSA, but now your PSA on surveillance has jumped up. So it's jumped up. This is very similar to the scenario that Professor Batista talked about. So. Um, and here's a patient um, at zero months. So this patient had a strong family history. His brother had died of prostate cancer. It, it, it came up very quickly. And so he had a PSA, it was only two, but uh, again, he was aware of our research protocols at the time. And so we did an MR and there's really nothing to see on this MR. 18 months later, his PSA had gone up a really tiny amount, but not a lot. It was kind of, this is within sort of normal noise with PSA, but if you'll notice here, this white spot starts to show up. 
and really small in a bit of an unusual location near the midline. And then at 25 months, the PSA really jumped. And we did a biopsy here and it showed again, uh, um, significant cancer, at least in three plus four at final pathology. So this is one we were able to catch a very small cancer. This patient again, because of his brother mm -hmm. elected to have surgery done and have the whole prostate removed and is doing fine. So, um, so again, another example of using imaging and PSA together to try and inform targeted biopsy, especially when the cancer is going to show up in unusual areas. Um, well, what's around the corner? And what I'm going to talk about now is not part of standard of care. So if you go to your physician and ask for this as part of treatment for your cancer, uh, they don't really have access to this outside of research or uh, private sort of enterprises in different parts of the world. So, but I want to talk to you about some technology um, that was developed at Sunnybrook, and we did the first in-human trials, and then was actually uh, expanded on, and some great work was done in London and at many other centers around the world as part of a group international effort to validate this technology, so that this is still underway. Um, but this is a technology, again, where we use MR, and it turns out MR can measure temperature pretty accurately. So radiation oncologists have ionizing radiation, and we have an ability to measure temperature. You may have heard about some of the work uh, being done in, in brain surgery using MR. Uh, this is not the brain, this is the prostate, but we are using a probe, this probe here, to deliver heat in a very controlled fashion to the prostate. And in fact, we can map out an area, it's kind of like a video game, and we can map out an area and we can actually watch over a, this is seconds up here. So this is actually pretty fast delivery and we can actually see this area. Red means that the tissue has been killed with heat uh, and we can treat uh, the area of cancer that we saw uh, in the prostate. So. Uh, this is an uh, uh, approach to, there's many different ways of doing this. You can use heat, cold, special types of drugs, all kinds of things, but this has been called the coin, the male lumpectomy. So a lot of interest in this type of work. Again, research, uh, not standard of care, um, uh, uh, but something that I think is interesting and around the corner. And the, the final thing I'll leave you with is you will, when you go see your physician about prostate cancer, hear about all kinds of new blood tests and urine tests. And this is actually extremely important. There are, there are tests that are uh, looking to be better than PSA. They're very, very exciting, very promising that can be done both on the tissue, on the biopsy samples and uh, in the blood that actually risk stratify better uh, and may allow for better decision-making. And so the combination of imaging with these fluidic tests, uh, I think really is a key part of the future uh, in making the best decisions and avoiding any risk for you. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll pass it back to Teresa. Thank you very much, Dr. Hader. I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Glenn Bauman to give us our uh, next talk. Thank you very much. I'm just going to give, uh, give your introduction. So our next speaker is Dr. Glenn Bauman. Dr. Bauman is a radiation oncologist specializing in genitourinary and central nervous system cancers. He's also a professor at Western University. His research focuses on modeling of the effects of uncertainty on radiation treatment delivery and multimodality imaging guided radiotherapy and cancer imaging. Dr. Bowen's talk will focus on prostate cancer treatment and the use of imaging to minimize side effects. And he will also discuss new treatments that are in the horizon. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Dr. Glenn Bauman. I'll be speaking towards the uh, imaging and the management of prostate cancer. Uh, my objectives are listed here, and we're going to go over the standard of care imaging for prostate cancer and then describe some of the applications of newer imaging, like MRI and PET. Uh, my disclosures are listed, and I will be uh, uh, mentioning uh, some of the work of my colleagues who have all been involved in uh, prostate cancer uh, research or, or, or research related to advances in prostate cancer care uh, throughout my talk. 
So uh, as, as you were well aware, prostate cancer is the most common uh, uh, cancer in men with a uh, one in seven men who will be diagnosed over their lifetime. But fortunately, the risk of dying from prostate cancer is significantly lower. Uh, the uh, prostate gland itself uh, presents some challenges in that it's uh, located in an uh, uh, inaccessible location, uh, sort of below the bladder here in front of the rectum, which makes it uh, difficult to examine and also uh, is a difficult organ to treat, be it with uh, radiation or surgery or other means because of the proximity of these other uh, important organs. When we think about treatment for men with prostate cancer, we tend to uh, divide men up or stratify men into different uh, risk uh, categories, uh, which tend to reflect the burden of cancer and the aggressiveness of the cancer we believe is there. And uh, our conventional um, risk stratification is based on the PSA level, uh, the Gleason score, or Gleason grade, which is uh, found through prostate biopsy, and then the tumor stage, which is uh, whether there is cancer that one can feel in the prostate gland or not. Uh, we know that we have a variety of treatments available for uh, men with prostate cancer, and we know that as a biomarker for understanding the extent of prostate cancer, PSA is, is, is helpful. It's not perfect, but it's helpful. And as uh, the levels of PSA rise, that tends to reflect more extensive uh, uh, spread of prostate cancer with low levels of PSA tending to reflect cancer confined to the prostate gland. But as PSA levels rise, then chance of cancer being invol involving lymph nodes in the pelvis or then spread to other parts of the body goes up. And our different treatments uh, tend to be uh, tailored to the extent of the prostate cancer with um, watchful waiting or surveillance often reserved for men with the earliest cancers, uh, surgery and radiation for men with more uh, higher chance of localized uh, cancer within the pelvis, and then for men with uh, cancer at risk of spreading to other parts of the body or having spread, we tend to rely more on drug therapies, which are primarily uh, hormone therapy based, so anti-testosterone type treatments. We know that um, uh, it's important to be mindful of who we choose to offer uh, treatment to. This is a randomized study that was done some years ago and it, it randomized men between surgery, radical prostatectomy versus just uh, watchful waiting. And what they found was that over long periods of time in the group as a whole, there wasn't any difference in the men, a number of men who died from prostate cancer. But when they looked in, more depth at this uh, study, they found that the men who did benefit more from uh, treatment were those who were younger, who had who were more fit, who had um, a higher PSA at, at diagnosis or more aggressive disease based on the on the Gleason score. So uh, basically, those men who either will live long enough to um, be at risk of prostate cancer becoming a life limiting disease, or who have more extensive or aggressive disease at diagnosis, which again makes it more likely to be a life-limiting disease. Um, as I said, uh, PSA and biopsy can be helpful tools for understanding the extent of prostate cancer, but imaging plays an important role, uh, both in terms of um, localizing or visualizing where the cancer might be in the prostate, um, uh, looking for spread of cancer beyond the prostate, uh, understanding how aggressive it might be and, and also how cancer is responding to treatment. And then this can have um, influence on different parts of uh, the cancer journey, be it from the diagnosis, treatment, and, and surveillance. So what do we mean by standard of care imaging? Well, these are imaging techniques that have been around for some time, but have proven to be useful in uh, managing men with prostate cancer. So the ones that are in most frequent use are uh, transrectal ultrasound, uh, which you've heard about, but also, and, and most commonly used to assess the prostate itself. Um, uh, whole body imaging with bone scan, which would be the single positron emission tomography or computed, tom commu uh, computed tomography imaging or CT, which can give us um, information about potential spread of the cancer beyond the prostate. 
And then there are optical techniques, which are really what the, the surgeon is using when they when they operate is is using visualization of the pro, of the uh, anatomy in terms of uh, conducting surgery. So as we've heard, the transrectal ultrasound allows us to visualize the prostate uh, itself. Um, most cancers are not visible on ultrasound, um, but the by visualizing the gland, we can uh, direct biopsy needles into different parts of the gland to systematically sample the, uh, the prostate. And this is the most common way prostate cancer has been diagnosed in the past. And as we've heard, um, uh, newer imaging may give us more uh, accuracy and a need for uh, less of a need for this sort of systemic uh, biopsy approach. But uh, ultrasound has also been used to guide other types of uh, interventions in prostate cancer, such as treatments with brachytherapy or energy therapy, such as freezing, which is cryotherapy, or, or using ultrasound to destroy uh, uh, cancer using something called high-intensity focused ultrasound. One of the techniques that is in common use, which is ultrasound guided, is uh, called prostate brachytherapy. And here we see the setup for a uh, brachytherapy procedure where uh, the transrectal ultrasound probe is in the rectum. This template provides a, um, uh, a grid and a coordinate system to uh, insert needles into the prostate. And here we see a real-time view of uh, the uh, ultrasound guidance of a needle in the prostate and uh, de deposition of brachytherapy seeds uh, along that needle track. And so at the end of a prostate brachytherapy procedure, you, you will have radioactive seeds distributed evenly throughout the prostate. And so you're radiating the prostate gland from, from within using this technique. Um, so for staging of prostate cancer, understanding if there are uh, if there is spread of the cancer outside the prostate, bone scan is a common modality, and and it really relies on a uh, a radioactive material called technetium ninety nine, which gets taken up into areas of the bone where there's a reaction to some process. So in the case of uh, prostate cancer, the the bone would be reacting to the presence of the cancer and lighting up uh, on a bone scan uh, with these sort of black areas would indicate areas suspicious for bone metastasis. But this is not 100% specific for prostate cancer and other types of uh, bone reactive processes can, can trigger a bone scan. So it, it, it's a useful test, but it's not, um, it doesn't have complete accuracy in, in picking up spread of cancer to, uh, to the bone, but uh, is certainly part of this uh, standard staging investigations. Um, Dr. Terry Peters, who you'll hear from later, is uh, uh, an, uh, started his career in the area of developing technology for computed tomography, which is a way of using x-rays to reconstruct um, uh, cross-sectional images of, of the body, which allows you to see within the body in these sort of uh, axial, these, these sort of bread loaf type slices. And then with modern CT scanners, you can acquire many of these slices and, and build it up into a three-dimensional uh, picture of what's going on in the body. And then using uh, computed tomography, you can see structures like the prostate here and the bladder and the rectum, but then also look for abnormal findings such as uh, on this uh, scan here, which is a view from the front, we can see the normal blood vessels here um, uh, with the uh, uh, inferior vena cava and the aorta, but nestled between them are these spots here, which are enlarged lymph nodes, which should not be there. So this is a, a suggestion that there may have been spread of, of prostate cancer in this man to uh, lymph nodes outside the, the pelvis, which has an implication for, for treatment. Uh, this type of commuted tomography can also be used within uh, radiation treatments for prostate cancer, and that's an area where Dr. Batista has tremendous experience and has contributed uh, a tremendous amount to, to advancing uh, um, uh, the use of uh, CT in uh, radiation planning and delivery. And here we see a, a CT scanner within a planning suite where, where we would uh, acquire images for planning radiation treatments and this is a, a CT image showing, again, the prostate, but now we see how uh, radiation treatment has been planned to uh, treat that prostate cancer. And you can see these lines represent 
where the radiation dose would be deposited around the prostate. And then from a side view, again, you can see how radiation can be sculpted to uh, cover this area of, uh, of the prostate. And in this case, we're also treating the lymph nodes. And this is the same man we saw before where we were concerned about lymph nodes in the upper abdomen. So in this case, we're treating lymph nodes um, uh, that aren't enlarged, but are at risk of having cancer but, and giving extra dose to those lymph nodes that were enlarged on the, on the CAT scan. The other uh, use of, radi of, of CT has been in, uh, um, incorporating it into the daily treatment of men with radiation. So we now have the capability with our radiation delivery machines to acquire a type of CT scan each day, which allows us to visualize a man's anatomy on a daily basis and make adjustments for it. So for example, here we see a comparison of two images sort of uh, sliced side by side. So on the on the left here, we can see that this would have been the image uh, that the uh, radiation was planned on. And you can see here the prostate and then the rectum was uh, a certain size on that planning uh, scan. But on one of the days of treatment, we can see the prostate here, but the rectum is quite a bit larger and has displaced the prostate anteriorly, uh, sort of pushing it forward. And so if we were to treat um, without knowing that the prostate had moved and the rectum was bigger, we might miss the prostate on that day of treatment or we might over treat the rectum on that day and, and cause more side effects. So using the daily CT scan allows us to uh, be very uh, confident in where we're delivering the radiation. And then we can be uh, very um, uh, conformal or, or very precise in how we shape that radiation dose and really keep the radiation uh, very much tight to the prostate itself and minimize the radiation of the rectum and the bladder. And by using this technology and this increased precision, we've been able to uh, do um, two things. Um, one is we've been able to safely increase the dose of radiation to the prostate to improve cancer control. But we've also been able to uh, shorten our radiation schedules by giving uh, bigger doses of radiation per day. So where in the past we might have uh, treated men over as long as eight weeks of treatment through clinical trials. We've been able to demonstrate that we can safely give um, radiation over four weeks and get the same good results and the same uh, low risk of side effects. And we are pushing down to schedules that are giving as few as five treatments over two weeks, uh, as you as you heard uh, uh, Dr. Batista describe. So um, this has a, a very beneficial effect for men in the sense that they're not having to attend for, for as many treatments. So that's a reduction in treatment burden and also is, is beneficial for the system in that it allows us to treat more men um, uh, with less resources. So it's, it truly is a win-win. And there's good evidence to suggest that uh, by moving towards these uh, this form of accelerated radiation with higher dose uh, per day, that um, the outcomes are as good or better than these longer courses of radiation. So this is uh, a, a study that was done um, at the Memorial Sloan Cancer, uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And they looked at their historical results where they treated men over eight weeks, and they did uh, biopsies of the prostate two to three years down the road after radiation. And they found in, um, with their, their traditional treatment, they found that they could see persistent cancer in almost 40% of men. But using the newer techniques, when they did these same type of biopsies down the road, they found that the, they were only finding prostate cancer in about 10% of men, su suggesting that this accelerated treatment is not only more uh, resource efficient and more convenient for men, it may actually be more potent and more effective against the prostate cancer. Moving on to optical imaging, so um, using um, uh, visualization of the prostate to direct surgery can be accomplished in a couple of different ways. So the most common method is through what's called an open prostatectomy, where an incision is made through the, um, uh, the lower abdomen, and then the surgeon can, uh, using uh, direct visualization, see the, see the prostate and, and remove it. And this just illustrates the change in anatomy before and after a prostatectomy. So here the 
prostate is situated uh, below the bladder in front of the rectum. And then after it's been removed, uh, one can see that the, the bladder needs to be reconnected to the urethra um, in order to reestablish that, that continuity there. So that accounts for uh, some of the early side effects of surgery where men might have a catheter for a time and are healing up and recovering their continence after that reconnection. And then this is just demonstrating what the prostate looks like after it's been removed. The prostate is here and seminal vesicles are uh, sort of an accessory gland that we remove with the prostate because it can have uh, be at risk of harboring cancer cells as well. And one of the newer advances in surgery is the use of uh, laparoscopic prostatectomy, which is using um, uh, 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 scopes with man magnification using uh, uh, so-called keyhole surgery, uh, where you can get a magnified view of of the prostate and the uh, and the anatomy where you're operating. And in the case of a robotic uh, assisted laparoscopic uh, prostatectomy, the surgeon is actually using remote manipulators here and, and using a heads up display to visualize what's going on in the abdomen. And the actual surgery is being um, executed by uh, these instruments controlled by these robotic arms. So this uh, interface gives um, uh, a lot of extra tools to the surgeon in terms of magnification to, to better visualize uh, the anatomy where he's, he or she is, is operating. And then the, the actual uh, manipulator tools themselves can um, be scaled to allow very fine movements and to correct for things like uh, um, uh, shake and things like that so that you can do very high precision surgery with this uh, robotic assistance. Uh, which is really just an augmentation of the surgeon's own skills. It's not the, the robot doing the, the work. And this is just some uh, images that uh, um, illustrate what's going on through with one of these laparoscopic procedures. So you can see the type of magnified view you have down showing the, the anatomy in the region. You can see some of the tools that are being used. Uh, this has a small uh, little uh, forceps on them. Uh, you have grasper tools to put clips uh, on. You have uh, coagulation tools. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Peters, uh, uh, one of his more recent areas of research has been in image manipulation techniques to uh, enhance these sort of heads-up displays and improve the quality of the information being uh, presented to the surgeon during these procedures. So, so we have a number of... Um, uh, treatments available for men with prostate cancer, radi ranging from different types of radiation, uh, surgery, and also um, uh, in some men, um, uh, active surveillance or careful monitoring. And uh, choosing between these treatments uh, can be a little bit uh, challenging. Um, when we do head-to-head -head comparisons, um, it, it becomes even a little bit more challenging because it, it would appear that in many instances, um, one can get excellent results with a number of different approaches. So this is a, a large study done in the UK, which compared uh, men who were at sort of the lower end of risk, so likely to have smaller amounts of cancer in the prostate. And then they were offered, uh, or they were randomized to either active surveillance, so just uh, monitoring of the cancer with treatment only if it looked like the cancer was progressing versus being randomized to surgical removal versus treatment with radiation. And what they found was that with uh, a quite long-term follow-up over 10 years, that the risk of dying from prostate cancer was, it was almost zero. Um, and it was very much the same, no matter which strategy you took. Now, those men who were on active surveillance did uh, some of those men did require treatment. So about at five years, about a third of men required treatment. And by uh, 10 years, about half of men required treatment. But one can see that with active surveillance, a, a big proportion of men would either be able to defer treatment for a significant period of time or might avoid treatment altogether. So, so this in this group of men um, uh, suggests that there are um, a few different approaches which can be uh, safe and effective. Um, in higher risk prostate cancer, where uh, one can see that there is a bit uh, higher um, 
uh, mortality risk from prostate cancer because it's a more aggressive disease. But uh, when one uses what um, uh, sort of optimal surgery ra or radiation techniques, um, one can see that the outcomes between all, th all these uh, three different uh, techniques is, is similarly good. So again, even for those men with high-risk disease, there can be several different options in terms of uh, the treatments you might offer um, and uh, in terms of expectation of uh, excellent cancer outcomes. The other side of the coin is what are the, the side effects of these different treatments? And, and uh, certainly all of the treatments choices or management choices have consequences in terms of quality of life and effects on men's well, well-being. Uh, what's interesting is if one measures at a very sort of high level quality of life across these different treatment options, over time, general quality of life seems to be very similar between uh, all the different options. But if you look at specific treatments, there are uh, certain aspects of quality of life that might be affected more by one than the other. So for example, for prostatectomy, um, uh, issues with bladder leakage or bladder control and issues with sexual function are, are probably the most common long-term quality of life aspects. With external beam radiation, bladder control is generally good, but there might be bladder irritative symptoms or bowel symptoms that show up and affect quality of life, and it too can affect uh, sexual function. Uh, brachytherapy, depending on how it's delivered and whether it's combined with external beam radiation, tends to be um, have a relatively good uh, side effect profile, but it too can affect uh, bladder function in terms of bladder irritability. And if men are on hormone therapy, um, it tends to decrease the sex drive and, and cause uh, problems with erections, but also can interfere with the man's uh, just general sense of well-being and have other side effects like hot flashes and such. And active surveillance, you might think, might be the... Uh, uh, the best option with, in terms of side effects, but there are definitely men where the uncertainty and anxiety of being watched without treatment weighs on them, and, and that can be a, a very significant factor for them as well. So to talk uh, briefly about some of the advances in imaging, we, we heard from Dr. Hader uh, that magnetic resonance imaging is definitely um, uh, becoming part of, you know, part of standard of care imaging, and, and there are plans to increase the utilization of MRI. Um, and I think the other uh, type of imaging that is rapidly evolving towards the standard of care imaging is so-called molecular imaging using positron emission tomography, either combined with CT or MRI. And as we heard from Dr. Hader, uh, MRI uh, can be used to help direct biopsies to either increase the accuracy of your biopsies or uh, reduce the number of biopsies or, or reduce the number of um, sort of uh, non-significant cancers you find on biopsy. And as we also heard, it can be used to guide um, interventions where you might be using energy therapy to ablate uh, early cancers in part of the gland um, using the MRI as a, as a tool for guidance. With positron emission tomography, we're taking advantage of the fact that one can create custom chemicals that will seek out uh, cancer cells and bind to them. And then you can tag those chemicals with a radioactive atom that you can then uh, pick up uh, using a, uh, the positron emission scanner and, and see where that chemical is concentrating. Um, we uh, currently are using a type of a chemical called PSMA which um, uh, it, the, these uh, tracers are designed to bind to a protein on prostate cancer cells called prostate-specific membrane antigen and are tagged with uh, typically with a radioactive fluoride atom. So this is an example of one of these compounds called uh, DCFPYL. And this is a PET MRI image of a prostate. So there, here's the prostate boundary here. You can see the different uh, components of the prostate on the MRI scan. But this bright spot is, is uh, where this PET tracer is concentrating in the prostate gland and highlighting a focus of cancer in the prostate gland. So this, this can be a very useful tool for identifying cancer within the prostate and, again, perhaps directing therapy or, or biopsies 
but also you can scan the whole body and look for signs of cancer spread to lymph nodes uh, outside the prostate or to other parts of the body. So for example, if we go back to that original case of the man with the um, uh, questionable nodes in the, um, in, uh, in the upper abdomen here, uh, you can see that uh, in the area where the abnormalities were seen on the conventional CAT scan, this area uh, lights up with a PET scan and gives you more information to say that, yes, this is likely to be prostate cancer in those lymph nodes. And one can also see uptake in the prostate itself. Um, these tracers have some normal uh, physiological uptake. So for example, they collect in the, in the bladder. So there's some tracer in the bladder here and some tracer in the liver. So they're not totally prostate specific, but they, they definitely are more sensitive um, at picking up sites of cancer than uh, traditional bone scans and CT scans. And so, again, this gives you more confidence in tailoring your treatments, and in this case, giving more radiation dose to these lymph nodes because you're more certain there's prostate cancer lurking in there. And then uh, this is a study that uh, we're, is currently underway at our institution in collaboration with Toronto Sunnybrook and uh, funded by the OICR and it is using this combination of MRI scan with uh, PET scan and CT scan to help us uh, deliver radiation that is better targeted to the sites of cancer within the prostate. So here we see an abnormality on MRI, which uh, looks like a focus of cancer, and there's an area of uptake on the PET scan here, but there's also a second area more anteriorly, uh, and then by taking both of these scans into account, we can then create a plan that delivers more radiation dose to that area of the prostate, and then a moderate dose to the remainder of the prostate. And then we're also using, in this study, um, the PET MRI scans to follow how the cancers respond over time to our treatments and better understand if these scans are helpful in, in uh, uh, being able to predict which men uh, are going to do well with treatment. And while these scans look impressive, um, sometimes when we introduce a new test, we um, uh, can find things sooner or we may find things that we didn't know about before, but it's, it's, it may not be clear whether knowing this is going to improve outcomes. So we're involved in a randomized study looking at comparing radiation planned with PSMA PET imaging versus standard of care imaging to see if this improves outcomes for men. Um, we've been offering this, this type of PET imaging in, our, in Ontario as part of a registry study, so we can understand how this uh, cancer, uh, how this PET imaging is performing uh, within men in, in, in our province. And uh, we've been seeing some um, uh, interesting results. The, the first uh, use of this is, was in assessing men uh, who had suspected recurrence after their initial treatment. And um, in that case, PSAs can be going up, but conventional imaging may not reveal where the prostate cancer problem is. And this is an example of such a man who had a failure with a PSA going up after prior radiation. And the PET scan helped identify that there was persistent cancer in the prostate, but also there was a spot of cancer in a, in a, in a rib. So this is important to know because in this case, this man may be better served by including hormone therapy or, or drug therapy as part of their treatment. And um, if, if, if all we knew about was the cancer in the prostate, we might have put that man through more aggressive treatment of the prostate where they may not have had the full benefit or he might have been under treating at the very least. And finally, um, the, there's a field of uh, evolving called theranostics, which combines this ability to see cancers at the molecular level with the ability to treat them at the molecular level by using, comp uh, using compounds that, uh, that use a radioactive atom that doesn't just allow us to see where the cancer is, but rather has uh, uh, emits higher energy X-rays that can actually treat the cancer when it binds to the to the cancer, and this is an example of uh, uh, a type of compound uh, called lutetium uh, one seventy seven PSMA. So you can see here on a PSMA PET scan, this is a man with quite advanced prostate cancer with many sites of cancer in the body, 
identified with the the C part of it, the uh, the, the PET CT part of it to visualize. But then when this uh, lutetium compound is administered, you can see it's concentrating in the same sites in the body where the cancer was identified on the diagnostic scan. But after um, several cycles of treatment, uh, you can see the volume of cancer goes down and there's less uptake of the compound because there's less cancer around. And then after the uh, treatment course is completed, uh, one can see on the diagnostic scan an excellent response with, with very little to no cancer to see. And there's a corresponding decrease in the PSA that goes along with this. So this is a very promising um, uh, uh, treatment, uh, primarily being used in men with, with advanced uh, recurrent prostate cancer, but, but, but studies are underway to understand if, if this can be helpful in earlier stages of the disease as well. So in summary, um, imaging plays a, an important role in the management of prostate cancer um, from diagnosis and selecting the, the appropriate uh, treatments uh, to uh, um, understanding the staging and, and uh, whether you need to um, uh, deliver the treatments in combination with, with each other or, there, or, with, or with drug therapies or uh, whether they can be delivered on their own. And we can uh, have more accurate treatments that allow us to intensify um, uh, treatment of the cancer within the prostate, but also to decrease our, our side effects. So I would uh, thank you for your attention. I'll pass uh, things back for the for our last speaker. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Bauman. So next we're going to call up Dr. Um, Terry Peters. To give this presentation, and um, can you unshare the screen? Thank you. I am going to um, introduce Dr. Peters right now. So, uh, Dr. Peters is a scientist at the Robarts Research Institute and a professor at Western University. His research is vast and includes image guided surgery, 3D visualization, multimodal imaging resolution, and I won't go on because there is um, a far a large of a list. Dr. Peter's talk will talk about his prostate cancer journey and how imaging can help to prevent overdiagnosis and over treatment. So thank you very much, Dr. Peters. Thank you, Teresa. Um, just a little bit about me as um... As already mentioned, I'm a Kiwi originally, and I'm fortunate to be back there at the time right now while I'm addressing you. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, early work in CT back in the early 70s, but I've been an imaging researcher in Canada for the last 45 years, about half of that being at McGill at the Montreal Neurological Institute and half at Robarts here at Western. Um, I've been involved in various cancer imaging projects, both in brain imaging for cancer stereotactic surgery um, at McGill and also here in, at Western uh, prostate cancer imaging for guidance of robotic prostatectomy as uh, Dr. Bauman um, already outlined. I've also been fortunate to have, have a chapter in Jake Van Dyke's book that uh, Jerry also and Aaron Fenster also share. So my journey began at the age of 60. Um, I'd had my PhD PSA being uh, monitored over uh, on an annual basis, and it started to rise. Um, it was getting a little bit higher than normal, and as it was rising, um, I started to have uh, biopsies. Now, rising PSA can be caused by um, an enlarged prostate or prostate hyperplasia, and also infection. So, but because my prostate was relatively small, the hyperplasia was ruled out, and I'd been given um, a dose of bio antibiotics, which ruled out infection. So this meant that there probably was a prostate cancer growing inside my prostate. But I thought some the biopsies were all negative. Um, and uh, it wasn't until the fourth one, four or five years into the, this journey, that a single core was um, detected had a detected um, cancer and had a Gleason score of four plus three. And so only one of those four um, 
where they were using systematic biopsy, which effectively is you're going into these different quadrants and hoping to hit something without any real guidance. This is really before the before ultrasound um, guided biopsy was complemented with MRI. So it was just the ultrasound That's right. which can't actually see the tumors. So then I was faced with treatment options, what, what to do about this. So wait for, wait for watching, which has already been described, um, was a consideration, but apparently I was too young at the age of 60. My cancer was too aggressive to, um, to sit and wait. Um, the Gleason score was too high for brachytherapy to be recommended. So it came down to the, the choice between radiation therapy and, and surgery. <laughs> Radiation and focused ultrasound, while they were available in some places around the world, were not available locally. So radiation therapy would involve um, around 40 treatments, um, could pose the risk of damage to the bladder and rectum. But as has been pointed out already, this would preclude later surgery if somehow the radiation therapy wasn't completely successful. The surgery Options involve both robotic or open surgeries, but um, I was made aware of the risk of erectile dysfunction and incontinence as part of this. So this led to a very agonizing time um, discussing my options with um, radiologists, with radiation oncologists and surgeons and neurologists, um, trying to look at all the risks and benefits and going through pretty much the same sort of uh, decision tree that Jerry just described. And in the end, we decided that we'd go with surgery. So my surgeon um, was actually the individual who had introduced robotic radical prostatectomy to uh, London, I, and perhaps even uh, Canada um, more than 15 years ago. But in spite of his expertise with the robot, knowing where he had detected the um, uh, cancer in the biopsy. He wanted to feel the margins with his fingers. Turns out he has really tiny hands. And so he was able to perform this procedure with a single four centimeter in incision, which in fact was less um, incisions that I would have required with the robot. Uh, my recovery was very rapid. Um, we started discharged after just a day and a half and the pain was really quite manageable. So it was um, I went home, was sent home with an abdominal drain and a urinary catheter plus a collector bag. Drain was removed after two days and the catheter after a week. I remember even going to the movies on the afternoon after I'd been uh, discharged from the hospital. So it, it was, really was a very quick recovery time. So I thought, well, this is cancer free at last. That's fantastic. Um, PSA was less than uh, 0 .5, 0 0.05 nanograms per mil um, for the next five years. But then started to climb up again, 0.9 and then 0.14. So where was this coming from? So we needed to check for the spread of disease. Was, was there something left behind if after the original surgery? Had, it, had something metastasized somewhere else? So I was subjected to the isotope bone scan that Dr. Bauman just um, talked about, as well as contrast enhanced CT to look for other tumors and perhaps lymphatic involvement. The only thing that, was, that showed up was a, a single bright spot in the prostate bed, confirming that perhaps um, this original prostate cancer that had been very, very close to the margin had actually expanded beneath, beyond the margin and was left behind after the gland had been taken out. So during this period, I was also part of a clinical trial um, looking at the combination of PET and MRI, along with the new um, positron emitting isotope, fluorine 18 choline, um, to help track uh, residual cancers that were floating around my body. And this was a precursor to the PSMA technique that uh, Dr. Bellman just talked about. So now it was time for radiotherapy. In my case, I had 30 fractions over six weeks using the intensely modulated radiation therapy technique, uh, which allows the um, radiation beam to be changed as the as different views of the prostate uh, uh, are radiated. I didn't have the option to go for the stereotactic um, technique that Jerry had described. 
but this system has an onboard onboard cone beam CT, which allows allows the therapist to adapt the therapy to daily changes in the position and shape of the prostate bed. Uh, one of the um, enduring memories from this period was the constant battle to ensure a constantly full bladder. Fortunately, I didn't have to take fleet between before each of the 30 fractions. That would have left me starving over six weeks, I think. Overall, it was a painless, efficient, and not, not unpleasant experience. As Jerry, I got to hit the gong at the end of the treatment, and 10 years on, my PSA remains undetectable. So I don't really have any regrets about the course of treatment. Um, I am glad I had the option to have the radiotherapy um, after something showed up uh, five, five or six years later after the surgery. But for any patient talking about um, their experience with prostate cancer, as Jerry mentioned, there is certainly an elephant in the room and the elephant re relates to the side effects. And the side effects that, that uh, I experienced were um, loss of bladder control, erectile dysfunction, and hematuria. So because surgery can damage the pelvic floor, which basically acts as a sphincter to restrict the, fl the flow of urine from the bladder, um, a patient following surgery may need to use pads for several weeks. But I found that Kegel exercises to um, strengthen the pelvic floor muscles gradually improved the situation. I was pretty much back to normal in six months. I know this doesn't work for everyone, and I am aware that surgical therapies are available for persistent problems. The other biggie, of course, is um, erectile dysfunction. And um, this varies, again, depending on the individual and the nature of the treatment. But there are a number of rem remedies for this, including drug therapy with Cialis and Viagra that everyone knows about. Um, pumps and rings can be quite effective. Um, there is a surgical procedure which implants a pump into the penis, um, and this um, also can be quite effective, but it also requires another surgical procedure. Um, something that looks on the surface to be quite horrifying is in penile injections, injections of a drug directly into the uh, penile tissue to increase local blood flow. And it really does sound a lot worse than it really is. And it turns out to be very, very highly effective. But in the end, um, you should really look at the best solution for you and your partner. Another, at least very scary side effect when it first happened, and this happened about two years after I'd finished radiation therapy, was hematuria or sporadic urine in the blood. Um, the first time it happened uh, was, of course, very, very concerning. And I had a lot of um, tests to try to pin this down. This is caused by radiation cystitis, which is not an uncommon side effect of uh, radiation, which results in scarring of vessels in the bladder lining. These vessels, because they're weaker than the, um, the lining, of the vessels is weaker than the natural vessels occasionally rupture and while they usually heal quite rapidly they can deposit quite a bit of blood in the urine in the urine but this usually lasts just for a, a day or maybe even less and it really isn't co cause for concern once you know what's causing it but if it does happen please have a urologist check it out because it may not be just uh, related to the uh, scarring of the bladder vessels, it could be bladder cancer, or it could be related to kidney disease. So some final thoughts. What if multiparametric MRI was standard of care in 2003? Well, maybe it would have resulted in a fewer biopsies than I'd been subjected to. Maybe it would have uh, given uh, the surgeon more information about his decision to perform open versus robotic surgery. And maybe there was a possibility of a better informed uh, surgery that would um, maybe have provided some nerve sparing. What about PSMA? Um, and it, it's still not standard of care, but I can see the time when PSMA will be standard of care and maybe it will even eliminate biopsies and we can go straight to what we know to be cancer um, within, and, and we know where it is. Um, this, so this should both improve surgical guidance and probably reduce the risk of recurrence. I'm not sure if the 
increasing impact of precision of imaging would have any any significant effect on my side effects to uh, either the surgery or the radiation. Uh, maybe with stereotactic radiotherapy, I would have had less, blood, less bladder, sc bladder scarring, but I think these effects would vary with the individual. So the bottom line is that um, prostate cancer is treatable if diagnosed early. Um, modern diagnosis techniques and treatments are very highly effective and they in rely implicitly on imaging. Um, and with the technology available today, um, full quality of life is possible following therapy. And in my case, both flavors of therapy, both for surgery and radiation. And just stressing that imaging is the key. And if I look at the imaging studies that I've had during my journey, um, there are nine different procedures and, and some of these have been, um, I've had multiple imaging studies um, in some of these modalities. So three cheers for imaging, it's a really integral part of um, prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment. So with that, that's my uh, story and I'll pass it back over to Teresa for questions. Thank you.